Hi, I thought you might like to see what the FAA's recurrent online test looks like. <laughs> recurrent test is by definition only for those who have taken their initial test. If you need to take the initial test, you will still need to go in person to a PSI testing center. Here is their website, and I'll of course put all links in the description. And remember, before you take your initial test or recurrent test, go to remotepilot101.com. Now, let's get into it here. I'm going to log in, enter my email. All right. All right, we're in. Looks like you go over here and you got some choices. Uh, part 61 pilots are manned pilots. I'm going to click on this. There we go. Description, blibbity, blabbity, blah, yeah, yeah. This training is designed for non-Part 61 pilots, like me, uh, who wish to remain current as a Part 107 remote pilot with a SUAS rating. Yes, yes, yes. To receive appropriate credit for this training, you must have an account, Got it. Be logged into that account, right? Be enrolled in the training. You must visit each chapter of the training. Okay. Well, begin this training by clicking on the blue button. Well, let's let's hear what's happening. So I guess I got to go through all this. Training overview. Welcome. If you wish to continue to operate small unmanned aircraft systems in the National Airspace System, or NAS, under 14 CFR Part 107, this training will describe the operational requirements you must satisfy. This initial lesson defines the target audience and scope of this training. The lesson then describes how the training prepares non-Part 61 certificate holders or Part 61 certificate holders without a current flight review in accordance with 14 CFR Part 61.56 to remain current as a Part 107 remote pilot with a small unmanned aircraft system rating. The lesson then describes the structure for the remaining modules and lessons in this training. Okay. Alright. Next. Uh, words. Blah, 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 blah. Next. Okay, next. Oh, oh, well, now this. Blibbity blop, blobbity blip. Next. This is all pretty basic stuff. You can blibbity blah your way through it, too. I just read very fast while comprehending. Yes, okay, so this just is making sure that this is not your initial. This is. Your recurrent and next of course print out your certificate at the end of this yes mm-hmm mm-hmm this gives you a bunch of training resources provided by the FAA and I'll just say that the first time I ever took the part 107 test with just the information from the FAA I failed it so remotepilot101.com words more words and now the exam hopefully this is it all right after receiving a part 107 remote pilot certificate with the sus rating how often must you satisfy recurrent training requirements that would be this one, right? According to 14 CFR Part 107, an SUAS is a unmanned aircraft system weighing 1,000. Well, that one. Unmanned aircraft means an aircraft operated. Well, well, yeah. Oh my goodness. Is this? How many questions we got? Lordy, Lord, 45 questions. Which of the following types of operations are excluded from the requirements in Part 107? Well, that would be the hobbyists. Right there, that one, right? Yeah. 
Which of the following operations require adherence to 14 CFR 107? That would be operating a SUAS for compensation. Sure. According to 14 CFR Part 48, when would small unmanned aircraft owner not be permitted to register it? Well, all persons are eligible. Which of the following statements is true about small unmanned aircraft registration with the FAA before operation in the national airspace system? Well, that one. When using a small unmanned aircraft in a non-recreational operation, who is responsible for informing the participants about emergency procedures? Well, the remote pilot in command, of course. A person without a Part 107 remote pilot certificate may operate an SUAS for non-recreational operations. Yes, under the direct supervision of a remote pilot in command. Fairly confident in all my answers so far. A person whose sole task is watching the SUAS to report hazards to the rest of the crew is called... The Visual Observer. The effective use of all available resources, human, hardware, and information prior to and during the flight to ensure the successful outcome of the operation is called crew resource management. Yeah. When adapting crew resource management and answering the previous question, concepts to the operation of a small unmanned aircraft, CRM must be integrated into all phases of the operation. You have been hired as a remote pilot in command by a local TV news station to film breaking news with a small unmanned aircraft. You express a safety concern and the station manager has instructed you to hurry up and get it done. What type of hazardous attitude does this attitude represent? And that's impulsivity. Under what condition should remote pilot in command of a small unmanned aircraft develop his or her own scheduled maintenance protocol? Well, when the manufacturer doesn't provide one. Again, here's an instance where the previous question is answered by the next question. Scheduled maintenance should be performed in accordance with the manufacturer's recommendations. As part of an overall safety risk assessment for flight, when should the remote pilot in command check and consider weather conditions in the operating area? Well, when would weather affect your flight? Uh, the entire flight, prior to and throughout the duration of every small U.S. flight, of course. While operating around buildings, the remote pilot in command should be aware of the creation of wind gusts. That, wow, really? Okay, that's the only obvious answer there. Part 89, remote ID uh, requirements. Well, if you're 107, no matter the size or the weight. Yeah, okay. A small unmanned aircraft without remote ID that is equipped after production with a remote ID broadcast module. Well, unmanned aircraft without remote ID that is equipped after production with a remote ID broadcast module. And so this means that if you have a drone without remote ID and then put remote ID on it, right? Mm, I'm thinking this is a trick question and then I'm going to get tricked, but I'm going to go with... Mm, I'm going to go with that one. Not really sure about that answer. A person may not use a remote ID broadcast module that... fails the self-test when powered on. Man, I don't need these anymore. According to 14 CFR Part 107, the responsibility to inspect the small unmanned aircraft system to ensure it is in a safe operating condition rests with the remote pilot in command. Before each flight, the remote pilot in command must ensure that. Well, the TSA has nothing to do with your drone. Site supervisor, I don't know what that is. Well, I'm guessing this would include the camera, propellers. I'm going to go with that. According to 14 CFR Part 107, who is responsible for ensuring that all control links 
between the ground station and the small unmanned aircraft are working properly. Well, that would be the remote pilot in command again. According to 14 CFR Part 107, what is required to operate a small unmanned aircraft in civil twilight or at night? Ah, use of lighted anti-collision lights. <laughs> again, look ahead to the next question. And, and you could get the answer for the previous question. When conducting operations before civil twilight or at night, the small unmanned aircraft must be equipped with anti-collision lights that are capable of being visible for at least, that would be three statute miles from the control station. When does a remote pilot in command operating at night have the discretion to reduce the intensity of the anti-collision lighting? Well, although this is rare, it would be whenever it's in the interest of operational safety. Yeah. To keep the small unmanned aircraft in the intended area and within visual line of sight during the night operations, the remote pilot in command should reduce operational ranges. During night operations, compensate for the night blind spot by looking 5 to 10 degrees off center of the UAS. That's actually very useful information. If the remote PIC cannot determine the location of the SUAS in relation to other aircraft during night operations, when should he or she land the UAS? Well, immediately. Yeah. Can't lose your situational awareness. <laughs> As landing an SUAS at night is particularly challenging, select a landing area. <laughs> what? Oh my goodness. According to 14 CFR Part 107, how may a remote pilot in command operate an unmanned aircraft in controlled airspace? Well, yeah, prior authorization. You can get that through Lance, L A A N C. Without prior ATC authorization, you can fly your SUAS below 400 feet above the ground and in uncontrolled airspace. To conduct Category 1 operations over people, the small unmanned aircraft must weigh 0.55 pounds or less, including everything that's on board. Right? Right, right? Yes. For Category 2 operations over people, the small unmanned aircraft must... Let me go with this one. <laughs> For Category 3 operations over people, the small unmanned aircraft must not cause injury equivalent to or greater than the impact of... I do remember this one because I thought it was ridiculous. Wow. Seems like a lot. Category 4 operations are limited to unmanned aircraft... Uh, uh, we'll go that one. Mm, yeah. For category one, two, and four operations over people, sustained flight over open air assemblies are restricted to small unmanned aircraft that meet part 89 remote ID requirement. In accordance with 14 CFR part 107, you may operate an SUAS from a moving vehicle when no property is carried for compensation or higher over sparsely populated areas. Well, yeah. In accordance with 14 CFR Part 107, except within a 400-foot radius of a structure, at what maximum altitude can you operate an SUAS? 400 feet, AGL, man. The FAA may approve your application for a waiver of provisions in Part 107 only when it has been determined that the proposed operation can be safely conducted. When requesting a waiver, the required documents should be presented to the FAA at least how many calendar days prior to the planned operation? Well, I'd say the most. And that would be 90 days. Damaged lithium batteries can cause an in-flight fire. Yeah. While operating a small unmanned aircraft, you experience a flyaway and several people suffer injuries. Which of the following injuries requires reporting to the FAA? Any injury requiring hospitalization. Within how many calendar days must 
an SUAS accident be reported to the FAA? Now, that would be 10 days. And the last question. To avoid a possible collision with a manned airplane, you climb your unmanned aircraft to yield the right of way. In doing so, your unmanned aircraft reach an altitude greater of 600 feet AGL. To whom must you report the deviation upon request? Well, first of all, you should never climb to avoid a plane. But if for some reason you do, the plane's below you and you want to climb a little bit, but you go, I would tell the FAA. Yeah. All right. Great exam. All right. One or more of my answers were incorrect. Review the questions below. Okay. I got a 93%. All right. Smaller, I'm not permitted to register. Oh, well. Really? Is it under 13? Okay. The other one I got wrong was person who stole task is watching us. How the rest of the crew was called. Oh. Oh, visual observer. Duh. <laughs> Small unmanned aircraft without remote ID. There's script after brother. Really? Really? Great exam. Yay! I passed the exam with a score of 100%. Did I find it informative? Eh, somewhat. Sure. It was just right. Would I recommend this? Yeah, that's what I'm doing right now. <clears throat> and not to fluff up the FA a little bit. <clears throat> you guys are the bestest. I bet everyone at the FAA smells terrific. Thanks. Oh yeah. That earns me some points. Send feedback. So now that you have choices here. That was easy. Uh, da, 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 da. Click here for my certificate. Gonna open it up. Okay, you get one uh, for your wallet. And you get one suitable for framing. So, there you go. Not as cool as this card with the hologram and everything. By the way, uh, you get one of these after you take your initial. They're still giving them out. Hold on to it forever with, with a death grip because they won't reissue these. Get out there and fly safely. Use common sense and also use remotepilot101.com. Well, that's it. Thanks for watching. Thanks for subscribing. All the pertinent links are in the description. Good luck and happy flying. Buh and bye. <laughs>